All right. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to another Hyperlexia webinar. Um, welcome back to those of you who have joined us before. Um, to anyone who's new, I'm Sarah Tamborski, and I'm the director here of clinical services at CHAT, um, and we'll be moderating. Um, if you are new, we are CHAT, which is Communication, Health, Advocacy, and Therapy. Um, we are a nonprofit speech clinic located outside the Chicagoland area. Um, we were known as CSLD, or Center for Speech um, and Language Disorders, for many years. Um, and we changed the name last year to really expand our work on advocacy and social justice. Um, and so um, we started this webinar series as we kind of hit COVID and wanted to make sure we we're expanding our services to everyone we can who may need our supports. Um, this afternoon is a continuation of our reading um, skills and supports for children with hyperlexia. Um, if you missed that first webinar, um, today you'll still be able to follow along fine, but we recommend you going and watching the recording of the first one on YouTube, um, and along with some of the other webinars if, this, um, if you've missed those as well. Um, this afternoon, we're gonna just kind of be going through some additional topics that we didn't touch on the first um, webinar on reading, and so we're gonna go through that kind of thematically rather than some specific questions. If you do have any questions that come to mind, please hit the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen and type in your questions and we'll try to get to those. If not, we're collecting them all and we'll answer them in the future um, to the best of our ability and answer them um, on our blogs. Um, this afternoon, we have Phyllis Kupperman um, as well as Kira Nally, um, who will be um, our expert speakers. <laughs> um, so to get started, I think Phyllis had a nice little introduction about how we can um, view um, all the things that we're gonna be sharing with kind of a, a good lens, I liked to think about things. Yeah, okay. So we're trying to cover a lot of bases in these webinars and, and you know, it, some, of my, some of these things, uh, these themes that come up over and over again um, and some are, specific to a certain group, um, but we know that each of you has a, a specific child uh, that you're concerned about, and we hope that you can adapt what we're saying to uh, that specific child, even if we're uh, bringing up ideas that your child may not be ready for or, or maybe too easy. Um, we hope that, that you're uh, you know your child best, you know the child that you're concerned about best, and while there are some commonalities, of course they're all precocious readers, and uh, that's why they have uh, the designation of hyperlexia, um, but, but uh, you know, we, we count on you to interpret what we're saying <laughs> and take some of the ideas that we're offering and um, uh, apply them in the way that suits that particular child best. Um, so, so reading, typically um, people think about reading as a learned behavior, that you have to teach a child to read and they don't read automatically. But we work, we're talking about kids who have either taught themselves or just been exposed and they pick up you know, at two and three and four, and and um, and they have difficulty, more difficulty with oral language. So they're wired differently for uh, language learning, and they're wired differently for reading. And so, um, some of the things that you read about uh, typical reading comprehension may apply, but they may not apply to this group of kids because they're. They're different. And also, we realize that some people think that reading is a visual processing um, uh, concept, uh, that, that the way that we read is uh, visually. But um, I think there's a combination of these two things that go on. So I'm going to ask you to think about, and I wish I could have a show of hands, but I can't see that. Um, I think about. Um, the Eiffel Tower, it, most of you, I think, probably saw 
that Eiffel Tower in your brain or visualized it um, and didn't think about the letters that spelled Eiffel Tower, right? But think about your grocery shopping list. Most of us, I think, would think about the words on the page and not actually see the milk and the bread and the cheese in our brain. Now, some, you know, who have, we all have different brains and some of you may, <laughs> may say, oh no, no I, I saw the milk and bread. But um, the, the, the point is that um, people are different in the way that they approach um, visual things and, and that we're going to talk about the similarities and differences and what goes into reading comprehension, particularly for these kiddos who uh, have a designation of hyperlexia. Okay. So, yeah. Eric, so, <laughs> pick up on that. Yeah, to get us started, um, we're going to talk about a little bit about the different components of reading comprehension. I know we touched on this a little bit, but we wanted to dive in some more. Yeah, um, so I would love to share a visual. Um, this is a visual that uh, we just found quickly online, but it really paints a really nice picture of the complexities and the different layers of reading comprehension and that um, really reading comprehension is based on so much more um, than just the comprehension piece. So uh, you'll see that, uh, you know, the print concepts are hopefully developing first, then we get into the phonemic awareness, vocabulary, there's fluency involved, then there's comprehension, um, and these all are building both simultaneously but also on top of each other. Um, so it's a very complex learning process. Um, and, and you know, Phyllis and I would argue that there's even more to this. I would add a whole attention column and I would add a whole listening column and a whole expressive language column. Um, and so Phyllis and I are planning on coming out with our own and just really um, developing it uh, to encompass everything that um, really impacts reading comprehension, but um, just for you guys to recognize how complex it is. Um, I'll talk a little bit about attention and active listening. Um, we at CHAT, we have a program that we teach and um, it's specifically focusing on language to literacy and a whole entire day of that program, of that cycle that we repeat every single week um, is focused on attention, listening and memory. Um, so, I mean, those are really the foundations of reading comprehension and literacy as a whole. Um, I also, during my consultations, primarily get questions on <laughs> that attention and listening piece, um, and especially in the younger grades because, um, you know, the kiddos are already reading, and so it's really hard to attend in a group <laughs> or um, listen when they can already read on their own. So I, I get a lot of these questions, and um, I'll kind of just go into some strategies that may work for you um, as kind of a starting point. And then, you know, there's thousands of strategies that you'll have to tailor to your individual client, to your individual child to help them with that attention piece. Um, I really like written schedules. I use them for myself and I use them for, you know, almost all activities. Um, you can make these as uh, gross, as wide, as vague as you want them to be. So it might just be one, sit on carpet, two, read red book, four, line up at the door, five, resource, recess. You know, it could be something like that, or you can make it really finite. First, sit on the letter A. Second, look at the teacher or look at the book. Three, um, listen to whatever word that you're listening for or something. I mean, you can make it really super finite. Um, I like that too, not only for the positive reinforcement that it's creating, um, but also if we're having, you know, off task behaviors or inattention, we can kind of refer back to the schedule and say, oh, look, that wasn't on our schedule. You know, we're, we did something that was not in our schedule and we'll see a lot of our hyperlexic kids really like the organization and the concreteness of that written schedule and kind of help to redirect themselves back to the step that we're at on that schedule. So I use schedules um, for everything. Um, I also really like positive reward charts. And so I know, you know, 
we can find something that's interesting. Maybe Timmy really loves airplanes, and so he gets an airplane sticker on his chart for every minute that he was attending. Um, you know, and you can scaffold that how it's desired. There's also, you know, we can help them attend by giving them active listening activities. So I think Sarah actually brought this up to me in a different conversation, but um, they might be the book holder um, when there's class instruction or when they're trying to attend to a certain task, maybe they first are looking for, you know, let's look for this word all over the page and see how we can attend that. So then there's purposeful attention, mm -hmm. but then also adding in kind of the comprehension and the task itself. Um, but you're just kind of changing a little bit of the focus or the task or adding to it. Um, there can be, you can do note taking. So maybe when you're listening to the teacher, every time you hear the word, I don't, the key word of the day, they have, they get to write it down. Um, and that's just very basic, right? Eventually you want notes to be purposeful. And so um, you can write down the keywords or um, if writing is difficult, you can draw down what the teacher is talking about. I mean, there's so many ways to be an active listener there. Um, so I've seen all of those be helpful with attention. Sarah, are you gonna add something? Yeah, and I think too, um, explicitly talking about what attending and listening looks like. And yeah. um, I mean, I think we're really big components of like attend, listening doesn't need to be sitting perfectly and like eyes on the speaker and I'm sit, like, that's just not natural. Um, and it's really not age appropriate for a lot of our kids. And so you may be lying sideways or hiding your chair or whatever, but if you're still attending, then that's okay. So I think, you know, changing expectations of like what is required. Um, but like some people need to be fidgeting in order to be paying attention. It's kind of like, are you meeting your sensory needs in order to be a good listener? And you know, that, that, what that looks like for one kid is going to be what it looks like for one kid. Cause the kid next to him may need something completely different. Like, you know, I, if I'm focusing on something and there's noises around me, like I can tune them out. I'm really good at it. Like I can just zone in my husband. If there's anything else going on, he's like, huh, what, what? It's like, it's, it drives him utterly nuts. And so we have very different things that we need. And each one of our kids is also going to have very different things that they need. Yep. Absolutely. And I think too, you'd be, well, you probably won't be surprised because you know these kiddos, but this they might be looking at a toy or looking at something else and you might think they're not attending, but then you ask them questions and oh, it turns out they were listening and attending the whole time. And so I think that's really an excellent point of just being flexible with your expectations and kind of check yourself <laughs> before you're checking the kid. Um, I think the next piece too is just that going more into that active listening. That's such a huge piece of the reading comprehension. Um, so I think some strategies that I've done are to practice active listening in a, in a controlled environment. So I want to be clear about scaffolding your expectations, right? A lot of times we get the questions because the student cannot attend in during whole group instruction with the whole class. Okay, well, have we tried doing it independently when he's just individual one-on-one? -on -one? Have we tried doing it in a small group? Have we tried doing it when, you know, he's really or they're really interested in the material? I mean, there's so many different layers to that. And so when we're trying to address it, just making sure that we're practicing at a scaffolded level with a systematic approach. Um, I, I like, again, just the holding the book and being an active participant in the listening activity. Um, I, you could do kind of like an I spy game, but turn it into I heard. So I heard this word, I heard this concept. Um, and just kind of making it fun and game-based so that it's engaging. Um, and that it, it doesn't seem like a chore. But I mean, that goes for all therapy, <laughs> not just hyperlexia <laughs> therapy. Um, so those are just some of the strategies that I've uh, used for attention listening. And I think, sorry, I'm talking a lot, but I use social stories a lot too, to kind of review. These are the expectations of circle time. And these are the expectations of, you know, in the math class. And these are the expectations when we're active listening um, out on the playground, you know, and, and I like those as well. So the other component, I, I, obviously with, uh, with um, active listening, you can certainly support that with written words. But the other component, of course, is a huge component, which is language. And language is um, infinitely complex. Um, and so much of uh, childhood literature uh, uses humor and uh, makes uh, uh, 
um, jokes about things or um, it's as we had talked about in the in in the last uh, comprehension you know comprehension involves the social understanding and uh, all, all that that goes into uh, children's literature so um, so we need to help kids actually understand that what a, a pun is, a word they may use, a, the wrong word that sounds like another word or that looks like another word. Um, and so you do things and most kids go through a, um, a period of knock-knock jokes, which is, I mean, that's jokes about puns. Um, and I couldn't really think of a lot of them, you know, so knock, knock, who's there, orange, orange, who, uh, orange, you gonna let me in, <laughs> you know, so, so um, I, things like that, um, you know, supporting humor, understanding um, a particular vocabulary that's used in, in uh, uh, children's literature, um, um, and I and I remember also that the kids have to understand um, what is not expected because that could be very humorous. So I was giving a talk one time in um, uh, Louisiana, and at the end of the two days <laughs> of me talking, I said we're going to do a thing on humor, and <laughs> and so I said you know tell me tell me a, a joke a local joke. And someone said, um, why did the chicken cross the road? And, you know, there's a million answers to that kind of joke. And, but their answer was to show the armadillo that it could be done. So why was that funny? I said, why is it? I don't, I don't get it. But what I didn't know was that armadillos are common roadkill in Louisiana and and so the chicken was showing how the slow moving armadillo would cross the road. So, so um, you know, there's, there's understanding um, and, and it has so much to do with how you use language and how you use um, the sounds of language, um, the visuals of language, um, and all, all that. And, and um, the other part of comprehension is really understanding who the characters are in the, in the book um, uh, or, or understanding, um, having the background information about uh, koalas if you're studying Australia. <laughs> we were just talking about that. Um, and, um, you know, understanding um, the, the common vocabulary that kids use. And so they need to know who the superheroes are. Um, because if somebody said you be Batman, they have to know what Batman is, you know? And um, so, or if there's a story about Batman, they're assuming that you already know about Batman and, and you know the background history of all that. So, and toy playing, knowing, understanding, if you've, if you've got Thomas the Tank Engine toys that, you know, if somebody says, give me James, that you're going to give them the right, the right <laughs> uh, uh, car with the, the right um, engine. So, um, so and, and all those things, because there's books about um, Thomas the Tank Engine, and if you don't know what they are, and if you have never seen um, the toys, you wouldn't really understand what the story is about. So, so there's a lot of language um, concepts and um, realities that go into reading comprehension. So, um, okay. So Phyllis, I think you were kind of referencing building schema, right? Like you didn't have the schema for the armadillo, so why was that even uh, funny? Right. Yes. <laughs> 
That's right. Yeah. So right. Right. We, we talk a lot about building schema. So yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, I think that was literally the next place we were going to go is kind of, we talked about that a lot last time too. What are some other ways we can help build schema? Because it can be a little bit of a overwhelming concept. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, there's, there are many ways to do that. And uh, uh, Kara, I think you have some uh, specifics. Uh, to talk about, but um, so so building schema can be done by experiences, by play. Um, I think we talked uh, or said this the last time um, that uh, you have to be careful about giving experiences and directing the kids' attention to the the reason that you're giving the experience because what they're going to look at are the signs in the zoo rather than, you know, where's the bathroom rather than learning about the animals or they're going to um, uh, look at the numbers in the hotel uh, uh, on the doors of the hotel rooms rather than, uh, you know, what's the best experience you had at, at Disney. Um, so, so building schema um, is really building background information and authors assume that kids know the schema, know that when they write their stories, they know um, what it is to be a friend if, they, if they're reading Elephant and Piggy. That, but a, a child um, who uh, is uh, not so social may not really understand the feelings of a friend. And, and so then that's something that, that you need to help them by explaining it and making it very concrete and writing it down and making a list and, and all those, those uh, visual things. So Yeah, so um, I think I just wanna put a disclaimer out there for kind of the parents and the professionals and therapists on this is that it might seem super overwhelming to try and build the schema before reading every single book that our students are reading. And, and that's, that's normal. <laughs> and so it's okay to read the book first and maybe you know, you'll be happily surprised if your kiddo understands more than you thought, but then you'll also get a clear picture of what to build and how to build it, that you can do it and you can reread the book later after you've worked on rebuilding that schema. So I don't want you guys to you know, not read new books because there's no schema, we don't have the schema, we can't read it. Um, it, it's okay to still get that exposure and then, you know, build the schema over time. And it, it is going to help with that reading comprehension, but there's also so many other things you can work on when decoding and reading too. So, so I think just don't be overwhelmed by that. Yeah. No, I think, you know, the, it's, it's multiple exposures is exactly the right thing, Kira. I, I think, you know, your comprehension in, in our program that we do for literacy, we use the same book over three days because we know that you need multiple exposures in order to really get you know the best comprehension and the way our program's designed is we don't touch comp uh, we touch comprehension multiple days but we don't truly focus on it until that third day so that way kids will have had multiple exposures so i think that's a, a great um way to think about it um and i think that actually leads in nicely the last point you made kira about um our next question was about the differences between decoding and um reading because that's reading every word. Uh, we're going to get Sarah back here. We lost her. So, um, um, so then, um, ah, here she is. Hey, okay. sorry. Uh, Sarah, we're talking about uh, decoding here. Okay. okay versus, yeah, versus reading. So um, the, um, uh, the point is that, that, uh, that decoding isn't all, and, and it's, it's not just being able to differentiate between mat and cat and bat. Um, it is really the uh, entire picture of reading and reading fluently. Uh, and, and even though you may see the, re the, the um, uh, written page as a whole or the written sentence as a whole or the written five words as a whole, and um, uh, but reading that way um, may affect comprehension. So we always have to check with 
um, the kids to see what they got out of the paragraph that they just read. And um, a lot of times as the kids get older, they're not reading aloud anymore, they're reading silently, and then it's really hard to figure out uh, what they comprehended. So our recommendation very often is to continue to do reading aloud so that you could check the prosody, you can check uh, whether they're skipping words, whether they're um, gliding over uh, words that they would actually need to phonetically decode. And there's so much to be learned of, um, uh, of reading aloud. And they actually can make reading aloud a really natural thing. And when you uh, parent a parent or, or a therapist or a teacher can read a page and the other child and the read or a paragraph and the child could read the next one and then you go back and forth. So it's not just an artificial thing that the child has to do, but it's a way of sharing a story and, and um, we can be talking about that. Yeah, I, I love using reading aloud as a strategy to kind of assess the comprehension. I think, um, you know, when you're able to apply appropriate prosody to um, a character's dialogue or when you're able to apply appropriate prosody when you're reading a question versus an exclamation in the text. I mean, um, that's something that we probably have to work on separately as prosody, but also when they're able to apply it is demonstrating that they're understanding the underlying overlying concept of what they're reading. So I, I love that. Um, I also really like kind of co-reading like you were talking about or turn taking while reading. One, you're working on that social piece of turn taking, um, but then you're also kind of making it like a, a you're, you're changing the focus of just being, let's just decode and read this. You're changing it into purposeful comprehension and, and a group activity. Yeah, I, I love using um, reading aloud and group reading for um, a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, you know, also a way of building schema because then, um, you know, if you're reading with the child and you realize that they are not really getting the, the gist of the story or really understanding the background information, you can provide it right then. And that's, that's it's, it's just a very powerful tool to use. And, and um, very often we think, oh, the kids can read on their own. We don't have to read to them anymore. But, but I think that we really do need to um, make reading a shared experience. And some of the kids go through a period where they don't even want to read anymore. You know, they, <laughs> you know, they're done. They learn that. Um, and, you know, because, because um, they, it may have gotten them a lot of attention that they don't want anymore. And so I, I say at that point, a read to your child. Um, if you're introducing a big uh, a, a chapter book or uh, wanting to develop some ideas that are in a, in a book uh, as background information, it's just a really powerful thing to continue to do. But always hold the, the written book so where the child can see it <laughs> so they can, can follow along uh, because then again you know you you need that they very often need those words um, to hook their uh, uh, imperfect language processing or, or auditory language processing onto so okay okay where are we um, I think next we're going to kind of move into a slightly different theme. It's still going to very much be related to reading comprehension, um, but it, it's specifically kind of building that success for children with hyperlexia in schools. Um, and so we, we get a lot of questions kind of related to that, and it very much is connected to reading comprehension because I think a lot of times um, that's kind of where the concern is, is like success in the school setting. Um. Yeah, so so um, very often when the kids come into school, uh, preschool and kindergarten and first grade, um, they they seem like they're very ahead of the game. Um, you know, some of them, you know, the kids that have um, more of a language uh, issue, or they may be more on the autism spectrum. Um, you know, the they the teachers can see what the issues are, but. There are very many of our um, kids with hyperlexia who 
can fit into the classroom pretty well and, and they can do amazing things. They can do math, <laughs> they can do, uh, they can spell words. They're the person, they're, they're the go-to people if a child needs to know how to spell something. Um, uh, so, so they look pretty precocious at that point. Um, but then as they get into the upper grades, they realize that um, it's not just learning to read, but it's reading to learn. And uh, so that's where there are more abstract uh, concepts going on. These kids tend to be concrete thinkers and um, they may uh, not be able to abstract from the information that they're given. And so you have to also work on that aspect of it. And um, uh, so, so in the hierarchy that we talked about the last time of um, basic uh, WH questions, so that they have, that many of the kids have trouble with WH questions early on, and they learn how to answer basic ones, but then they have to learn how to answer higher level ones. And um, do we have the, that um, visual of the higher level? Um, oh, right, yeah, of, the, of your book. Yeah. Yeah, let me pull that up. Yeah, so, um, uh, and, and a lot of this in the classroom needs individual attention. And that's one of the things I think we were getting at it. <laughs> When I when I riffed off onto something else here, um, but um, but let's let's stay with let's stay with this. So um, in in the uh, uh, reading comprehension kit uh, level two that I had uh, put together, um, there are little cardboard um, set, uh, phrase strips that you can fill in. Uh, on, in, in the uh, blank, so there's closed sentences. Yeah, so there's different colored ones for different, yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, so the basic questions um, to, to test for comprehension are, you know, the what, where, who questions. But later on, um, we talk about things that are not specifically uh, uh, talked about in the story. And so, yeah, so the why questions. And so, you know, uh, there's one question here in the story about trains is, you know, why was the train, the whistle soft at first? Because they heard the whistle, the very soft whistle in the distance. And then the train whistle was soft at first because, and then one of the choices is because the train was far away. But this also brings up um, a science concept, you know, that that uh, sounds that are far away take time to travel and they're softer. And then when the train came closer, um, the little girl in the story had to close her ears because it was so loud. Uh, and this was the same uh, sound that that um, she heard from far away, but much softer. Um, the same thing that why did the train look little from far away? Then this is the next question. And then, then um, you know, the train was far away. And then when it came closer, um, you know, the train was huge. And so that's something to, to be talked about that was not directly illuminated in this or illustrated in the story, but um, these are the higher level um, analysis of, of how well you understand the concepts that many kids just get automatically, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think um, just knowing that you can work on these concepts too, you can build off of this. So. Um, I, I have this fun game that I found when Phyllis was talking about just um, increasing the sound and why something might sound a certain way, quieter or louder. There's a fun game that I knew about. I can share it. You guys all might want to turn down your speakers and headphones for a second. Um, 
but it's simply a game and we'll have to listen to the sound and it's kind of like hot or cold. The louder the sound gets, the closer we are to finding our target. Yay! <laughs> I found the cow. And so I think just, just bringing that up, like you can teach these really difficult inferencing concepts with games like this and with, you know, writing about them and talking about them differently in context. So maybe you read this book about Brianna with the trains and then you go and sit at a train station and you talk about how it sounds quieter when it's far and you can hear it coming or, or you see a car in the distance and it's coming closer. So you can really build the schema across multiple contexts um, and, and really help with that understanding as well. Um, I wanted to quickly go back to your school question, Sarah, and um, I find myself that one of the <laughs> one of the recommendations that I recommend nine times out of ten are a one-on-one, -on -one. Um, and a one-on-one -on -one can serve so many purposes. You might call them a shadow, you might call them an aid, um, you might call them a para, a para pro, um, but they they serve so many purposes. I know for one of my clients was extremely precocious and academics was never a concern but her attention um, and sometimes her inattentive behaviors were somewhat problematic and so she needed a one-on-one -on -one who could help redirect her attention help her refocus provide guidance um, I often try and explain that one-on-ones serve as almost a translator uh, between an auditory verbal world into a visual written world. And so um, we're kind of translating language that way to be better understood and make it more concrete. Um, I think that, the, you know, a one-on-one -on -one or an aide can be the translator, can be the behavior management, can be a sensory input provider when we need it, can be a break provider, um, can also help when you're scaffolding from, you know, individual to small group to large group to whole group work. They can kind of be that facilitator. When you get to the older grades, that one-on-one -on -one can be the one constant with your kiddo as they're transitioning classes. You know, the one-on-one -on -one could help. And so when, you know, you have a different teacher for math, science, and history that all might teach in different ways, that's almost like four different languages that, that our student has to understand, right? And so having this translator helps to be that one constant. Um, I also really like that, um, the the one-on-one -on -one can uh, help provide peer support so they can not only act as a peer and provide a peer model and social engagement they can also help to support that during recess or um, during game breaks um, so i think that they're really um, beneficial for the whole range of um, ages and even skills and abilities honestly um, and i think too just wanted to let you guys know that Phyllis and I are very happy to consult with you guys and be a part of an IEP team. I'm on two, um, in two IEP meetings coming up for students across the nation um, that, that we can kind of help and provide some guidance. Or if we're not part of the team, we can provide um, some PDs for your school or the educators or professionals at that school. Um, so please just reach out to us if you want more guidance for how we can be tailored and specific to your specific students. Yeah, and I think, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I just I think to piggy off that, literally the A in, in chat stands for advocacy, and so that is something that you know we really want to make kind of more broadly aware. And why we're starting to do these webinars is because um, hyperlexia is not a, a widely known phrase um, and term. Um, and so I know even in my when I was in grad school, I think it maybe showed up on one slide in one class, and that was the extent of my knowledge of hyperlexia before I came to work here um, and got to the end of the wonderful tutelage of Miss Phyllis Kupperman. Um, and so um, being just advocates, you know, we know that is like kind of ends up being, you know, the second job of most families. Um, and so, you know, we're here to help and support in any ways we can, you know, sharing webinars like these, but also, you know, doing some consults. Those are all kind of options. Yeah, I think um, when kids are first getting into school uh, and, and um, 
sometimes if people are not familiar with, if the school staff is not familiar with hyperlexia, they may think that it is just a splinter skill. It's, well, they can do that, but look at all the things they can't do. So um, we um, help parents to understand that their role is to show um, the teachers and the staff and, and the, the therapists that they're working with um, how to use the precocious skill to build all the things that we were just talking about. And so that may be um, one place to start with the very young children and, and, um, uh, and really um, push that understanding that this is, um, uh, you know, this is, this is an asset it is not um, an isolated skill. It is not just a savant skill that, that uh, happens in, in isolation, but it is something that is useful and can be uh, uh, built on for reading comprehension. And, and uh, you know, that's our soapbox for that. Um, yeah, so uh, let's get back down to some practical matters here. Um, I think we can talk a little bit um, about guided writing. I know that we wanted, we touched on that briefly last time and I wanna be more specific about that. Um, so I guess just first, you know, there is clearly a strong relationship between writing and reading, um, both in the expressive and receptive uh, pieces of that. So um, Phyllis, I didn't know if you'd wanna talk to us more about um, guided writing, and I really would love for you to kind of touch on that example that you were sharing with me yesterday. I just loved it, and then we can kind of go from there. Okay, so um, so uh, uh, guided writing could be very many things. It could be using templates and, and um, uh, visual models and lists and things like that. Um, one of the things that I loved to do, particularly with some of the older kids who didn't see the purpose of writing actually, um, but um, to to actually write along with them and and um, uh, guide their story creation because this helps them understand how it is to be an author, and so um, this you know so this is one of the the templates that can be used. Um, or there's a bunch of te templates that can be used, but um, there, you can also do it uh, organically, you know, so you can, you can take uh, a story that the child already knows, like the three little pigs, and um, make it the three little cows, and have it not be uh, the big bad wolf, but it could be the big bad rooster, uh, you know, and so there's many ways that you can change a, a story and, and develop that and develop the characters in that. Um, up to um, the older child that um, I was telling Kara the story about, I, um, he, uh, this was a young man who was uh, starting high school and he really, um, he read factual things. Um, and he did pretty well at school, but he really hated writing assignments. And, and he was in an English class where they needed to develop a short story. And so, um, so I was the scribe and I was on the computer and we talked about a story. And so one of the things that he was very interested in was World War II and he knew all the facts about World War II. He knew the dates of the different battles and who the generals were and who, uh, you know, all the all the things that the he was he really was very knowledgeable about um, the history. But he didn't really know much. I'm not sure what kind of concept he had about war, and but he did know all the outside information, you know, and and you know, could talk about that endlessly. So we decided that we would build a story around his interest. And with my guidance, because I was asking, I said, well, we have to have some people in the story. So there's a story about a boy and a grandfather who had been in World War II. And the grandfather um, 
and this was create, created um, characters. So we tried to flesh them out as an, uh, as an author might and tell a little description of the boy and uh, about the grandfather and where they lived and all that because you know, this boy was really not very interested in fiction and he didn't understand how fiction worked. And I thought if we create it, maybe he'll get it. And so the grandfather was very resistant as many grandfathers had been in World War II about talking about it. And he never really talked about it to his grandson in the story. And so we then built a whole story about the boy talking to his grandfather about uh, and then the grandfather, of course, had personal experiences um, that were painful and, and all the rest of that. And it was um, an astounding story. Um, and while I, I set the stage, the guidance, many, I, I, as we went along, and this, this took us a couple months to really finish the, the story. Um, and I, I was just very gratified to see that by the by you know as the, the story went along he had ideas he had ideas about what the characters would say he could re write dialogue he could um ascribe a feeling and it was just a transformation of that so that's my guided <laughs> guided <Yeah>. story <laughs> story well, love that for so many reasons. One, um, you were the scribe. So it may have even just been that his difficulty was with that physical act of writing. I mean, and there's so many supports that we can do as therapists and parents to help with that. So he was ascribed to you. I love that. Or you were ascribed for him. I love that. And then I really liked when you were talking about it, that he was working on so much more than just becoming the author and telling a story. He had to work on theory of mind to understand how and why the grandfather was feeling that way. Um, he had to think of different characters' dialogues. And so not only was he developing this appreciation for fiction um, writers, um, but he was working on those social skills. Um, and yeah, I just really think that this is a fun way to express <laughs> and that he's expressing in a way that he learns, right? through written language. And so I think that's a great activity. Mm -hmm. And starting with the, the, the place of his interests, I think was, you know, a thing that we can all take from and what we're constantly, you know, is starting where they are starting. Um, and so whatever that interest may be, um, using that as your kickoff place, because you're, you're going to have that much more buy-in and um, success. Mm -hmm. I think some other ways you can scaffold this too for, you know, the writers who aren't really into writing. <laughs> um, or you can co-write by switching by word, switching by sentence, switching by paragraph. You can have this templated script out for them so that they get used to a pattern of how they should be writing. Phyllis, I know um, one of the strategies that you use for essay writing are we have a concrete, it's, it's not a scripted template by any means, but it's steps. So one, create the topic sentence two through four, add details, and you might have, you know, used a graphic organizer separately to understand and define what those details are, and then wrapping it up with the conclusion. And so I think also just relying on those patterns that we've all learned in school um, is really helpful, um, as well as using those graphic organizers and almost pre-planning, use an outline, pre-plan what we're going to write so that we can make sure that it's cohesive at that point. Yeah, I think that gets into one of the things, you know, we wanted to elaborate a little bit more on with some of those like higher level skills. And I think um, this example of writing a story is, is a wonderful one. Um, but, you know, you know, there were some questions about, you know, doing comparisons and contrasting and teaching, um, you know, main ideas and analysis. Um, even though we we're starting to work on these really higher level concepts, we were discussing, like, it still goes back to the basics on how you can do it. Um, and, you know, we keep I, you know, Phyllis has said many times in Korean Problems to get her a t-shirt, it's not rocket scientists. Um, but like for something like a uh, skill, skill like comparisons, like go back to making lists, make a list about everything you know about the first item and make a list about everything you know about the second item. And then we can circle the things that are, you know, similar and we can highlight the things that are different. And now we have a compare and contrast. Um, you can really use those foundational skills like of writing things out, of lists, 
um, to help with some of these higher level concepts. And actually going back, uh, going back to these basic concepts, even for older kids who um, have to compare and contrast ideas, but maybe don't really understand how to, what that means to compare and contrast, to go back to the basic, um, you know, a list of, of attributes of two different things and how are they the same and how are they different so that they can also translate that to ideas that are, that can be compared and contrasted. So, so there's all these ideas can be used at a very basic level and then you can extrapolate to a higher level um, thinking or some of the kids that can do that. I think that's a really interesting concept. So um, that kind of just goes back to the schema that they have about the concept, right? And so it might not be automatic for our hyperlexic learners to find that the appropriate or relevant schema. And so what you're doing in that instance is you're kind of withdrawing and showing that they do have the schema to relate things and bring it to the forefront of their mind so that they can apply it to something that's functional and readily or and necessary at the time, right? So I think that's a really interesting concept. Yeah. yeah the, the, the trick is that so many things have to happen at once. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. that we, you know, then we go, okay, wait a second. Let's step back a little bit and analyze what it is that we really do need to work on. Um, that would be foundational to some of the higher level kinds of things that we're trying to expect the kids yeah. to do. I think it's a nice example of kind of that blend of like um, skills that you know familiar with, but branching into new is um, that one story um, that me and Kira can remember, which was um, <laughs> uh, what is it again? Actually, because it's the, the extension of Hugo Cabret. Yeah, um, can you explain what that that is, Kira? Like, because it's kind of a yeah, funny. Sure. Um, so I can explain it a little bit, but Phyllis has used this for years. Um, I had a student kind of come into the clinic and he was reading this book. And mind you, he was seeing me because he hated reading and, and really struggled with reading. And so when I see this middle schooler engrossed in this chapter book and could not pull him away, I needed to know more. And so it's this invention of Hugo Cabret. And it, it's this amazing book that has chapters that are written but then also chapters that are purely illustrated. And so it's really interesting because the illustrations also move the story forward. And so I love this for hyperlexic learners because we're practicing the reading for comprehension, but then we can also practice looking at pictures and then we can write the dialogue for them. Maybe we write the script, we write the narrative during those picture chapters, and then it goes back into written chapters. Um, I think also just that it's so engrossing for so many kids. Um, Phyllis, you kind of were the one who re-brought it to my attention yeah. yesterday. Yeah, so, so um, the other thing about uh, the invention of um, Hugo Cabret, and it's by Brian Selznick is the author and, and the illustrator actually, and it was made into a movie, uh, Hugo, so uh, they can also see that. But some of the characters are, they are characters in real life, there's Georges Milliers, who is the grandfather in the story, actually was a pioneering uh, filmmaker and did stop motion. So you can go online and find out about Georges Milliers and the automaton, which is a machine that draws um, and draws a picture of um, one of Georges Milliers' movies, uh, A Trip to the Moon, where the a uh, rocket goes right into the eye of the moon illustration. Um, uh, and you can you could go online and find that movie. And so it's it sort of bridges the gap between fiction and getting into the characters and the and the boy and the and then there's a real part of it that also grabbed their attention and it's it's just a really powerful um, a wonderful book. He's done some others, but this one's the best. <laughs> I, I love this one. Uh, Phyllis, you also brought up another book that he illustrated, Frindle, um, and that's really interesting because it, it's 
very explicit in playing with words, playing with language, um, and that it, it talks about different languages. I know a lot of our kiddos are fascinated <laughs> and often teaching themselves multiple languages. And so there's a book that's talking about that. So yeah, so that that so the the that would be sort of a middle grade book, and and um, a lot of schools use it because it's set in a school, and um, it, but it's wonderful for our kids because it has um, a, a new coined word frindle. So so yes, yeah, so you can you know if you um, search. Uh, the children's literature at various levels, you can usually find something that that is um, transformative for some of the kids, and that's that's the fun of doing <laughs> working working with them. It's finding that that thing that turns them on to the next level. So, yeah, I mean, I think it really comes down to sparking that excitement about what you're working with. Um, I think. You know, we were just talking with some other um, community partners this morning and I was saying, you know, it really comes down to in any session and work that you're doing is can you make it exciting and fun and engaging because then you're going to remember what you're working on and it literally changes the way your brain is working on you will use all of your brain if you're excited and enjoying and there's fun involved versus just a small section of your brain and um, it's just, you know, kind of, that's always the goal is to try to get as much engagement and fun and to continue the joy and um, the reading. Um, so we do have another webinar that we have planned um, in a couple of weeks on the 23rd. Is that correct? Is that my date right? Mm -hmm. 23rd. Um, that'll be part two of the um, social skills. Um, and then that's the last one we have planned for the immediate, but we do plan on having um, at least quarterly hyperlexia webinars. Um, and we are still kind of working on what the, the timeline and logistics and topics will be for those. But um, if you have any ideas, feel free to email us. Um, you can just email info at chatwithus.org if you have some requests of certain things that you want us to go over. But um, we're still collecting any questions that people have. And so um, we hope to see you in another future webinar. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Bye.